Pour écouter cette session en français, veuillez cliquer en bas de votre écran sur l'onglet Interprétation et sélectionner le drapeau français. Hello. Bonjour. Barry Saleho. On behalf of Ikle Africa, the African Center for Cities, our future cities, Red Cross Crescent Climate Center, and partners, we're excited to welcome all of you to the Rise Africa 2022 Action Festival. Rise Africa has been growing since 2020 as a platform for thinkers, doers, and enablers committed to inspiring action for sustainable cities. This year's theme is creativity. For me, this means blending skills to be able to communicate the climate change complexity in rapidly urbanizing cities. I think we have such untapped potential in Africa when it comes to creativity. I love the idea that we need to create space to be creative. I think so often we rush into trying to act immediately um, and creativity is a a good reminder to sit back and to really tap into the capacities we have. I think agency is finding ways of giving power back to people, to groups, to young people, especially on a continent where it's a very young population. The, the, the value, the inputs from the youths, people who are considered inexperienced, have valuable contribution and they're really taking that into consideration. I think what agency means to me is change from, from the ground up. The importance of urgency is the recognition of the past and the recognition that we've lost time. Urgency is about acting now to build more inclusive, productive and resilient cities. There's this need to creatively redesign and unlearn and explore new ways of thinking. The festival is hosting 33 sessions with 135 provocateurs from across Africa and the world. Every session aims to show new ideas, showcase ongoing action, and launch new initiatives, bringing participants together to chart a new route forward. We hope that the festival program will inspire you. At the festival, we encourage you to showcase your business and projects, build lasting partnerships, unleash your creative potential commit to sustainable action. Rise Africa is about translating ideas into action. What actions are you going to commit to this festival? Before the session begins, it is important to note that you're being recorded. And by participating, you are given the consent to be recorded. All recordings will be available on the program page after the festival. Creative expression is vital for creating new futures for our cities. And so we invite you to enter this session in the spirit of creativity and dreaming. Je vis avec un mal dont je ne suis pas le porteur. Je vis avec un mal qui me donne de l'espoir. Atteint de l'albinisme, déficience intellectuelle, handicapé physique, malentendant, malvoyant, je suis dédaigné par la population. Exclusion, désaffiliation, Je suis exclu de la société. Ils disent que je suis différent d'eux. Discrimination, marginalisation. Je vis en marge de la société. Je suis la risée de la société. Stigmatisation, ségrégation. Je proteste contre les travers de la société. Je refuse ce mode de vie. Inclusion, insertion. Nous promouvons l'alphabétisation. L'éducation inclusive. L'accès aux infrastructures, l'accès aux services sociaux pour les personnes vivant avec un handicap. La création d'un système distributif pour réduire la pauvreté. La reconnaissance du travail non renuméré. La réduction du chômage à longue durée. La valorisation de l'égalité pour toute la communauté. Je suis différent d'eux. Le handicap n'est pas une fatalité. Sachez que mon handicap a fait de moi une bombe à épanouissement. Sachez que mon handicap a fait de moi une bombe à épanouissement. Bonjour et bienvenue à notre session à Rise Africa 2022 Action Festival. Je suis Rashik Patar, je suis le CEO de Our Future Cities. Notre uh, session aujourd'hui est entitled Design for Innovation, Creativity at the Forefront of Housing, Public Space and Mobility Solutions. Je suis sûr que c'est quite a mouthful. But we'll get through it together today. Um, before we begin uh, our session today, I'll take you through a very brief introduction as to who we are as an organization um, before we get 
get into the credible speakers and, and their conditions. We just have a technical issue. Just give me 10 seconds. address our urban challenges. Uh, we want cities that work for everyone. Uh, we incorporate foresight in everything we do, even if we are sometimes ahead of our time. We are led by research, experimentation, and diverse perspectives, even if those perspectives are challenging and difficult. Uh, we work with governments, business, communities, and individuals. And that's quite important to us, that we're not uh, limited to partnering with, with particular groups or sectors. We understand that solutions require working across disciplines, dimensions, and scales. Uh, and that isn't just about the latest trend or buzzword. Uh, I won't mention some of those. Uh, it's about how we commit to our just transition incrementally through small steps and big leaps. It's about transforming places, shifting mindsets, redesigning systems, changing rules, and developing platforms. Because our future on this planet is tied to the future of our cities and towns. We're co-creating future cities that are sustainable and equitable, but also exciting, vibrant, and loved. Uh, just mentioning some of those, well, reflecting on some of those projects, uh, you'll note from some of our past work, they range from public spaces to affordable housing policy to experimental collaborations in terms of mobility, um, important conversations like Rise Africa and the Urban Festival in South Africa as well. A lot of work in looking into more affordable uh, house, uh, new ways of working between government and uh, private sector as well. Um, at times, it's installation, exhibition. So we're not always that phased about the medium, but uh, we love that we get to work across these different cities and scales uh, and dimensions, both physically and, of course, not today virtually. Uh, just a reminder that every day at 3 p.m. our Future Cities is hosting a session at Rise Africa 2022 um, that intersect with the, the three core elements of creativity, agency, and urgency, which forms the uh, curatorial theme for this edition. Of course, today, um, our session about to start. Um, tomorrow, Futures and Possibilities for Our Cities, in conversation with myself, looking at uh, uh, somebody who has cycled across part of the country, we're speaking to an architect. We're speaking to somebody about constitutional um, uh, devolution of powers to cities. Um, so really looking at the, the possibilities rather than just uh, concrete projects. Uh, and on Wednesday, we look at uh, investment or what it takes to invest sustainably. Uh, in particular, uh, if there is this urgent need to invest in uh, sustainable infrastructure or sustainable urban development, uh, what is that need? Uh, who is providing funding for it? Who is not providing funding for it? Uh, and where is funding actually moving? And we'll be having, hearing from uh, a few different uh, viewpoints uh, during that session. Uh, for those who missed the 12 o'clock keynote lectures today, um, those lectures are, if I'm not mistaken, already online. And you'll have your chance to engage with those uh, speakers tonight at 6 p.m. Uh, either GMT plus two or Central African time for a more personal, relaxed evening conversation. So uh, grab your dinner and grab a drink and join us at 6 p.m. for the daily debrief um, and reconnecting with the, with the three, rather four keynote lecturers today. Uh, just some housekeeping. Uh, if everybody could please make sure that you're muted at all times. You're of course welcome to ask questions please use the raise hand function. I think you click on yeah, reactions and then raise hand. 
Um, the session is being recorded. I think Zoom would have notified you of that already, but fear not. Uh, the recording, which will be slightly edited to, uh, of course, remove any errors, will be available online in a week or two. Uh, and it would be great if some of the, the big ideas you tweeted or shared across social media using the hashtag uh, Rise Africa 2022. And if you really are um, uh, able to, you can put the, the letters Rise in capitals. And then our theme for this year is hashtag Creativity Agency Urgency, also another mouthful. Um, we really appreciate um, your time here, but if you do have an extra two minutes, please complete the survey which will be pasted in the chat. So what did you like? What did you not like? Um, how, how was RISE for you? Um, you only have to complete that once, but we'd love, um, uh, if not today, but on Wednesday or Thursday, if you reflected on, on the entire festival. Um, so just coming back to um, our topic for today, we'll be exploring how will we live differently in the future? How will we move differently? How do and will young people play and connect differently? And how will we trade differently? And I'd like to, to start by introducing our first speaker today, which is Antonio Chiara. Um, just a reminder that uh, there'll be plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. So you could uh, put your questions into the chat box or um, save them for the end. But we'd love to get through uh, all of our speakers um, yeah, in the first part of today. Uh, so Antonia Chiara is a mother of two boys, 14 and 15 years old, living in Nairobi. Uh, she has over 15 years experience specifically designing new products and services for SMEs and corporates as a consultant, spending most of her life in R&D, dreaming of a better world with better products and services that make a difference. She has spent the last five years rethinking food and housing from a socioeconomic point of view, with the aim of impacting climate change, small farmers, small traders, and the rapidly growing African youth population. Uh, she has been working to get farmer direct food to consumer with the Eastern Central Africa Small Scale Farmers Forum and designing sustainable urban buildings for young people with quarter acre developers, which we'll hear more about shortly. Antonia Chiara is committed to designing food and housing products, services, and solutions that enable consumers to make greener Africa-focused economic choices in their day-to-day -day lives. So thank you very much, Antonio Chiara, for joining us today. And we look forward to you sharing how you're using creativity uh, in your work, uh, in particular, the, the Quarter Acre project. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rashik. <clears throat> Shall I share my screen now? Yes, go ahead. Okay. So hello everyone, um, thank you for being here. I'm so excited to present this project that I've been working on for at least six years now, I think, um, researching. And we finally have a product, which is an apartment block. <clears throat> we designed um, this apartment block with the future in mind, um, thinking about how we can have more sustainable buildings. So our main brief was looking at the, at the apartment as a village, and I'll talk more about that. So cities, cities have been growing rapidly in the last hundred years, and they're going to continue to grow with about 60% of us living in <clears throat> urban settings today. So, you know, cities are not going to stop that development. Cities were also kind of born out of the need for, at least in Nairobi, for the colonialists to house their workers. And so the first question with Africans with this RISE festival was, you know, how do we build sustainably in an African context? How do we build sustainable cities? And for me, it was quite interesting because the, the concept of cities in itself, I don't feel is very African. Um, the way that we approached work and lifestyle was quite different. Um, so we wouldn't have built cities this way. And people continue to flock cities as well for economic uh, prosperity. Um, so they will just continue growing as long as capitalism exists and people are looking for more cash. However, if we continue building how we're building, you know, we're obviously going to face some serious climate change issues. 
So <clears throat> I got my inspiration from the Kikuyu culture. I'm Kikuyu myself. I didn't learn any African history, not even Kenyan history in my education. And it was just... Antonia, really, yes? apologies to interrupt. You're on slide nine, just in case you want to start on slide one. What? Your on. presentation is showing, showing I... slide nine or 14. So I'm not sure if you should be on the first slide or that is the first slide. I'm actually on the second slide. So let me, can I just stop and start again, maybe? Yeah, let's start again. Yeah. Okay. Okay, can you see slide one? Perfect, yeah, slide one, okay. thanks. Slide one, slide two, cities, Perfect. and now, okay. Um, yeah, so I was saying that um, I drew most of my inspiration from the Tikuyu culture, which I had no knowledge about. So it was really interesting for myself on a personal level to just you know reconnect with um, what my ancestors, um, how they lived and what their logic was. Um, <clears throat> and actually in, in researching that, I discovered that it's not just Kikuyu culture, it's most African cultures and indi indigenous cultures had certain values that were similar. And those values are closed eco -leaps, loops, a culture of sharing, um, putting food and housing together, so subsistence farming, using local materials to build, minimalism, there wasn't, there wasn't much stuff, people didn't need much stuff, there wasn't a consumer culture, and there was also a culture of, of sharing. Um, so all these um, values we decided to sort of adopt into quarter acre apartment block. So quarter acre apartment block is an 80 bed apartment block sitting on a quarter acre which is the most developed size of land in Kenya and it's built for young people um, probably in their first second third job it's also looking at you know how do we house, house the future of Africa which is predominantly young <clears throat> and if you look at the building first off it just looks like a normal building so I think that's you know something else that people kind of when they're thinking about sustainable buildings the design is, you know, still going to be, you know, personal up to the architect or whatever, but what makes the building sustainable is really looking more at the materials and how we use the materials and power conservation and all of that. So we've used um, very eco materials, we've maintained lots of light, um, and it looks really modern, which was something that we really wanted to maintain. We have lots of social areas, again, mirroring the Kikuyu culture. Um, yeah, so I'll just talk a bit about the parallels um, between the quarter acre apartment and a village. So one of the things that um, I noticed about the Kikuyu culture is that they all traded within nearby communities. So all, all neighbours and um, members of a community, were, it was everyone's business to make sure that everyone was well and that everyone was trading. So we incorporated what I'm calling a community trade center, which is in the ground floor, where tenants can display their works, whether they make stuff, or whether they have a service. Um, and we realized that if, if, if they were to sell their service product to the 80 people living in the apartment, and let's say, you know, each, each apartment has like 10 unique visitors in a year, it's like an audience of about 4,000 people. So this is, I think, was the big shift, kind of looking at tenants, not just as tenants, but looking at everyone in the building as a community and looking out for their welfare. The other thing that we incorporated was group food buying. So um, in Kikuyu communities, they organized for food for the whole community together. Um, and so we have a relationship with the farmer community that would be um, sending everyday food products to the building twice a week and that would be included in the service charge. So it's more affordable for the tenant, but also helping the tenant to have a low carbon food print. Um, we also noticed in the Kikuyu uh, homesteads that there was a lot of social areas and social activities were quite a big deal. And I think in lockdown, 
we can all relate to how how hard it was to be locked in and how important it is to have relationships and social gatherings and things like that. This was actually our biggest challenge, trying to keep the building profitable and still maintaining the ground floor and the rooftop as common social areas. <clears throat> so we have a cafe, a co-shared working space, a gym, a laundromat, um, a barbecue area and chill out spots. We have a disco bar club and a cinema as well that can be used for presentations in the co-working space. And so the idea is that if anything, you know, if we did ever have a lockdown, you'd be able to like, you know, kind of live quite a full, full life in the apartment. So again, looking at the apartment as a village. Um, also in the Kikri culture, um, what's interesting is the homestead was sort of seen as a wider area, not necessarily the physical spaces where people slept and cooked. And so um, the outside was, the, you know, which the Kikri is called Ja, was, um, you know, where most of life happened. So we tried to design the building with a lot of indoor outdoor feeling. Um, our best design case in point is the balconies. So we noticed that um, in cities, a lot of balconies are just not used because there's not enough privacy. So we have breeze blocks and, and a kitchen garden with like wide open doors so that you can feel like you have a little garden even though you're in an apartment. Then we've used localized materials. Um, all our, most of our materials are local. We have biogas, solar, water, rain harvesting and recycling, which is sort of like closing eco loops as well. And the sharing of transport, we have two cars and bicycles. And, you know, we're still looking into more of what people can share. So in, in the Kikri culture, people shared a lot of tools. It wasn't important that, you know, every single person had their own tool. So what makes quarter acre apartment block sustainable? So we've got a lot of plants everywhere and cities are getting hot. So that in itself just will help cool cities down. Um, we have addressed the indoor air quality with breeze blocks, plants, fire mesh, cement screen paints. We're um, conserving and managing our energy. So we have solar, we have smart meters for the light, smart meters for low flow water. Um, energy efficient appliances like um, fridges and washing machines. We um, are recycling the water and using it in our landscaping. Again, we are using 80% local materials and actually half of our materials are also upcycled. So again, closing loops, you reusing waste. Um, we've looked at how, you know, we're trying to minimize the transport of how far um, our materials and products are coming from. Again, reducing our carbon footprint. And then in our design, we're very minimalist. So we've removed things like the cabinetry that you typically see in bedrooms and kitchens. Um, you know, we have leather latches instead of door handles and things like that. So just, you know, one of the ways that we've been able to achieve affordability is by just having less of, of everything and being quite minimalist. And then we've also kind of tried to look at all our products and, and you know, kind of, um, analyze their manufacturing process and choosing products that um, have low power power use, such as mud brick. So I think, you know, when it comes to sustainable buildings, it's really about the materials, I think would be the most important thing for builders and architects, um, designers to look at. In Quarter Acre, we've used mud brick. We've got upcycled Tetra pack boards, which are used from waste food packaging materials as um, non-structural walls. We also have um, agri waste boards, which is waste from farms as well. And then we're using those for non-structural walls as well. We have upcycled plastic bottle tops um, for lights. Um, we have upcycled tin for lights. We have upcycled wood, upcycled glass, cement screen, sisal, makuti, leather, brass. So about 50% of our materials are upcycled. So when we were designing the building, we were also thinking about the consumer. <clears throat> so many people I know are concerned about climate change, but have no idea how to live a greener lifestyle. 
And so we wanted to attract the kind of tenant who wants to live a greener lifestyle and also, you know, use design to enable people to um, just by being in the building, live a, a low carbon footprint lifestyle. So, you know, working from home, which is quite common now, especially after COVID, reducing trips, you know, trying to um, build in the 15 minute city concept. So also by having all the amenities around, um, they don't have to go very far. The bicycles, the shared transport, um, the farmer direct food and, you know, recyclable containers. Um, you know, just being in a low consumption building is also just if someone was to analyze their carbon footprint, I think this would really make a difference. And then again, promoting um, minimalism as a lifestyle. So all this is kind of put in the design. For example, there's not that much storage. So as soon as you get into the building, you kind of have already signed up to uh, uh, a different way of living. So I think our biggest innovation <clears throat> is combining food and housing um, and looking at tenants as a community, um, you know, which is the whole village as an apartment block concept. And agriculture and food contributes to 62% of climate change issues. So I think this one action, if it was replicated on scale, would just make a massive difference to climate change. And, you know, in, in Kikuyu culture and in most indigenous cultures, food was not separate from housing. Um, and so I think, you know, if we could start to look at things like that, you know, as developers, even as we develop, you know, estates for a thousand people, it should incorporate a farm. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest takeouts that we can take learning from the Kikuyu culture and indigenous African cultures. So yeah, cooking is a big contributor and by having biogas, we get our biogas um, from the tenants themselves and also from the farmers as they deliver the food, they give us their, their organic waste as well. Organic waste is everywhere, every day we're, you know, we're cooking and, and, and creating waste. So I think it's an amazing resource where, you know, biogas is an amazing um, opportunity for us to actually go green and make a difference. Um, so we also wanted to design something that could be scalable um, because if we just have one quarter acre or two or three or four, it still isn't going to have that much on, a, on a, of an impact. We need a thousand or a million sustainable quarter acre type buildings. And I think it needs to be an industry effort. I mean, one of the challenges that we faced was finding the right architects who believed that we could build a sustainable building. Um, a lot of the reasons are because the market is not ready. And I think that we need to kind of lead the market through design. Um, and so these are a few things that I'd just like to share that I think that we can all adapt to scaling this philosophy across Africa. So, you know, using of local materials, I think we just need to make a commitment to using our creativity to design things that look nice. If you look at the, the quarter acre images or designs, they're all really beautiful. So not, you know, not, you know, creativity is about limitations. So I think we need to get used to designing within the materials that we have um, at, in our local areas, rather than looking for fancy imports, um, you know, to, to make our buildings nice. Recycling and use, reusing is a very African thing. I see it a lot in slums and villages. Um, and so we're quite used to not, um, you know, just sort of taking, using and throwing. Um, I think if the more that we can just keep reusing stuff, not having to buy new stuff, um, it's quite African from, you know, the old, old days. And I think, I think it needs to become more of a, a culture in modern day times. Organic waste is everywhere, so we should take advantage of that. Construction waste is everywhere. We should also take advantage of that. And I think it's 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 part, it's it's up to the building industry to actually, you know, create the sustainability loop and close the eco loop. So I think we need to collaborate a lot more to do that. Use solar, we're in Africa, we're blessed with the sun, rainwater harvesting um, and reusing designing a culture of sharing as well. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's so many dead items that we buy 
that sit around in our houses that we don't use, you know, maybe we use once a month or whatever. There's so many things that we don't all have to buy so that we can just, you know, reduce our consumer lifestyle. Um, so, you know, whether it's sharing um, resources or doing things together like group buying, I think is something that could help us be more sustainable. And then again, minimalism, just needing less, having less, um, you know, not trying to keep updating stuff. So designing things that actually last, which is why we want to use the cement, cement screed so that you don't have to keep painting. Um, and just thinking that way, and this is also like a brilliant way of how we've managed to become an affordable building. So our, our, our studio is um, 3.8 million shillings and our one bed is 5 million shillings. So we're on the affordability bracket. A lot of it is just having less. And then bridging the gap between farm and fork, you know, whether it's a development that includes, you know, farm in their in their project, urban farming, kitchen farming, rooftop farming. I think, you know, buildings and housing need to come together. Yeah, so that's quarter acre. Thank you very much for listening. Okay. Can everyone hear me now? <laughs> Working. Don't trust earphones. Um, I'd like to introduce, thanks Antonia. Thanks so much for reminding us that, that resources, be it waste or the sun, are truly everywhere. And it's really about how we use this to, to change how we live and, and the way we build to live as well. Uh, our next uh, presenter is Carl Jacobs who's the principal architect and founder of C76 Architects in South Africa. He will share a bit about the Sharpa Soweto Center. Many of you will know it as the Nike Football Center. Um, he's the principal and founder of C76 Architecture or Architects. Uh, and before opening this practice in 2014, Carl graduated from the University of the Free State and has worked as an architect in Johannesburg since then. Um, the work of C76 is quite diverse and it's clearly influenced by Carl's rural upbringing, which I think is a great link to, to some of the, uh, the values and um, ideas shared by Antonio as well. The practice's work is based on grounded architecture of simple design strategies, focusing on the client's needs, the project's context, culture, and the environment conditions in order to create unique architectural solutions. So thank you so much, Carl. And you are welcome to share screen and start your presentation. Can everybody see that and can everybody hear me? Yes, thank you, perfectly. Okay. I just wanna say thank you very much for this opportunity to talk about um, uh, Shopper Soweto. Um, it's a it's a project that's very close to our hearts and very close to the co community aspect of, of what we did in Soweto. So thank you for, share, for for the opportunity to share this. I just want to basically tell you, just to orientate everybody where this project is situated. So on the top right hand corner, the red circle is Jobic CBD. Um, the icon shows the, the Nelson Mandela Bridge and you move southwest which is um, incidentally what, why it's called Soweto, Southwestern um, Township. So when you go down Southwest, which to the left of this, of this image, 
you go past the Soccer City F&B Stadium, you go past a couple of mine dumps, and you go past the um, well-known um, Soweto cooling towers, and approximately a kilometer from there, from the cooling towers, you will find the Shopper Soweto um, facility, which is indicated in the bottom left of this image. So just a brief history of the project. Um, it is basically, this facility was built in 2010 um, for the Soccer World Cup that was in South Africa that everybody knows about. So this image is a current image, but to show um, the, the building that everybody knows is the, is the slatted timber facade um, with the white Soweto written on, onto, onto the building, which, which we kept. Um, but it's also the main reason why we changed the facility um, to, to be more part of the community because the community going past um, Krasani Drive couldn't see this elevation. All they saw was this green um, ablution block at the back. So basically the, the elevation at the top was the facility in 2010 where you see the Nike swish on that elevation is the, what I call the field house which is the slatted elevation we kept. And to the behind to the south, connecting to Krasani to the right-hand side here is the green building, the ablution building, which became the focus of, of the entire design is to connect uh, this facility more to the community of Soweto. So what, how we did that is we took away that, that green, that green um, ablution box, opened the, um, opened the facility so that the people from Soweto could see into the facility. And the other very, very important part personally was the fact that when the first time I, I went there, it was a very barren place with not a lot of trees. So there was a massive focus on, on adding uh, a lot of landscaping to, to this uh, new facility. We, and I want to recognize all the partners and collaborators in, in this project, from the cleaning ladies to the builders, to the architects, everybody. There's a lot of people involved in this project. And we focused on the start to do a project that focused on Soweto and the community of Soweto. We didn't want to do something that didn't connect to the immediate community. So Soweto as a whole, the color schemes, the graphic design, everything was connected and was focused on Soweto itself. And you can see the color scheme going through from the roofs and the surrounding areas of, of the facility that went through this, this whole, whole project. So um, with our collaborators, we went, we did a lot of research in the beginning, speaking to a lot of young professionals, young kids, um, a lot of goals because uh, the initial brief from our client Nike was that the facility in 2010 was just a soccer facility and we needed to make it a more inclusive facility that had a, a bigger range of sports and not, not just soccer. So we asked around and, and, and there was a lot of questions and a lot of input from, as you can imagine, from the young, from the younger generation, so we know that uh, what they wanted. But the, for me, the main thing that came out of all of this research was the fact that Young girls, mostly, and also boys, had to look after their siblings in the afternoons when both parents went to work. So they wanted a place where they could take their, their younger siblings to play and kick a ball around and be active without playing in the streets in Soweto, where it's kind of dangerous with all the traffic and the taxis around. So that was a very, very important part. And, and, it, and it just um, cemented the fact that we were in the right the right um, area for our design in order to do a community-based project. Um, very importantly, um, as Antonia sp sp spoke about, um, sustainability and materials for us was a difficult thing to do because it's a sports facility, so we had to use a lot of concrete, which is a lot against our philosophy as a design practice. If you look at our previous work, we, we, in 2016, we did a lot of recycling, recycled brick, recycled glass in, 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 in buildings in, in, in town in Johannesburg. So for me personally, it was very difficult to, to accept the amount of concrete we had to use. But, you know, sustainability is more than just materiality. Sustainability is for this project to last a long time and not fall apart. So concrete is a, is a great material for... Um, for that, and especially when there's skate parks and a lot of kids running around. We, believe it or not, did research in, in seeing if we could do the skate park in rammed earth, but it, the amount of, um, of uh, cement that we had to add into the, into the rammed earth in order to make it so it doesn't, brit, it doesn't break apart, it's just not worth it, so we had to stay with, with, uh, with, um, with the normal concrete. Um, Nike has a lot of in, in, innovative materials that we could use. Um, 
So we use that at, at, at places like recycled rubber um, for table, for desks, recycled rubber in tiles and stuff like that. So there's they, they brought a lot of innovative material, recyclable, sustainable materials to, to the party. So basically uh, what I want to focus on is, uh, I have to go through this very quickly because it's a, it's a big project, but the, the social yard was the main, like I said, where that green building was, was in, the, in the previous images was the main focus of this project. And so I want to, I want to really focus on the aspects um, of, of the social yard. I'll just quickly, just to show you the extent of the project is to sh just to give everybody a, a, a run through what we actually did is that on the top of the, of the screen is, is the, is the new athletics oval that we, we did, uh, surrounded by a lot of berms, um, which, which is mounds of soil that we just planted grass on top of it. Um, with a lot of trees where people can then, without building formal seating, they can lie under trees and on these berms in order to uh, watch their friends run on the athletics oval. And this was a theme you could see all through the project about the amount of trees and this landscaping um, project that we want to do, because this doesn't exist, exist in Soweto. There's no secure, safe, green park that the kids can go and play. So that was a huge focus for us to, to, to do that for the people, for the community of Soweto. The other thing is, if you can, you can see number nine, there is like a cross country running track that we added to a lot of the research. Also people said they wanted a safe place to do fitness. So we added this cross country running track around the facility. Um, number seven there is, uh, was the, the soccer fields. That was the existing 11 site soccer fields that was built in 2010. We just added bleacher seating on the one on the left-hand side there and a the players, players seating in the middle. Um, and then at the bottom part is the social yard. So the social yard, as you can see, is, is the most, most activity that we did there is basically um, the field house is in the middle there, number three. And then behind it's a social yard um, where the skate park is, um, multi-purpose course, kiosks and all and that type of stuff. The images on the side just show you the athletics oval, a view from top of the field house into onto the 11 side soccer fields. And this is the current view at the bottom um, of the facility from Crisani Drive. So this is just a zoomed in plan of the social yard. So basically what we did here is we connected the, like I said, to Crisani, which is at the bottom of this page, we connected the facility more to the community and to the thousands of people that drive past um, um, this facility every day. So basically you'll see on the sections in, in the next couple of slides, you are elevated when you drive past this facility. So you look into, you can see all the activities, all the kids playing around. We changed the main entry from where the parking lot was on the side of the field house to from Prisani Drive where number one is on the image here. So the main entry and the connection is then visible for everybody to see and it's, it's really accessible where previously it was a bit hidden. A major thing for us was to, to remove the high boundary walls around this facility and make the, the, the because South Africa is, is very famous for the high boundary walls and fences and stuff. So we had to, um, well, it took a lot of convincing for the securities uh, for, for, for Nike to, to let us do a, a low wall. <laughs> so you'll see on the images that, that we did this low round earth wall um, in order for people to look into the facility and not play behind this massive, massive wall. So to the to the left hand side there, number five is the is the the skate park, um, which you funny enough you were thinking Soweto soccer and it was a surprise for me as well. Or football is the main sport, but it is hugely popular um, skateboarding. And at the moment, it is the facility. It's the part of this park that gets used uh, the most. So it is extremely popular the skateboarding, which which I'm very happy about. So in the middle there, where you can see the community where we did the community research, all the um, faces of the of the local community kids was was implemented in the in the artwork. And around that area where the, it's a multi-purpose basketball court, we, ha we have these kiosks where people would sell food that was produced by the veggie garden we introduced on the right-hand side past the five-a-side soccer fields. Um, where Because a, a lot of research people wanted to know more about nutrition and what they need to eat in order to, um, in order to um, you know, be good sports people. So we, we implemented the veggie garden to, for the facility to grow their own food. And as you can see, a big, big focus for us was the greenery. So we wanted to add as much trees as humanly possible, 
into this facility. And because of COVID, we, we, you know, we built this project from 2019, um, the end of 2019 to 2021. So we went through COVID, um, the heart of COVID. So we had a couple of a budget cuts. So the first thing that went a little bit where we had to save was the landscaping, which was a very sad thing, but we, we managed to plant a lot of trees, uh, but a little bit smaller than, than we went anticipated. A lot of seating, berms, and, and stuff like that for people to enjoy underneath this canopy. Um, and also, you'll see the, those red spots is an outdoor gym facility. And also, number one at the entrance we is the start of the cross-country running track. So the focus for us was to open this park up to the community of Soweto, seeing, in, uh, introducing sport to everybody, you know, making it part of life, being um, fit and wanting to be part of, 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 a, of a better life. The materiality, sustainability and all that was, uh, was unfortunately, we had to use a lot of concrete, as I said, but we did use rammed earth and stuff like that, where we incorporated the community to, to, to learn more skills, do rammed earth, get paid for their work. And that happened in several aspects of, of, this, of this project. The security guards are all people from Soweto. So the, the client was active in, in, in incorporating people into this facility from around the community um, of Soweto. Just um, very quickly, the main attraction of this facility, if you drive past it, is this canopy roof, um, which is this red square um, a roof at the top of, of, of this page. So basically, this whole facility had to be, because Nike is a, is a, is a quite a, a, a big brand, obviously, in the world, and it's, it's, it's a bold brand, we had to do something that, that you know, was bold um, and, and in your face. But the thing is, is the thing is that this, this canopy had to perform like a Nike shoe or any of their products. It, it's bold and everything and colorful, but it, it does what it has to do. So we did a lot of research into how this, this roof can shade properly. And we had to find ways to, um, to get the community, the African patterning, African weaving into this expression that we did for this roof. Um, and, you know, so we used a lot of graphic elements of the Nike swoosh was at 23 five degrees and we, we we worked out these triangles with with our collaborators and implemented those into into the pattern of this of this roof and we used rebar um, to create these um, big um, um, tiles in order to to shade the the, the, the people in the facility um, um, on a very obviously very hot summer's day so furthermore we used trees to, to grow through this this canopy roof in order to enhance the shading and we did a lot of research about how a pergola would, would um, shade effectively and to the best of its ability. And we did that by introducing a double layer of shading. And what that in entailed is that as you walk through the facility, um, the movement and the weaving and the pattern making that you can see on the bottom right image there also then effectively spoke to movement, which is obviously sport and Nike and also the African tradition of weaving and pattern making. We didn't want to use specific pattern making like in the ballet patterning. We wanted something that is unique to the facility and unique to this project that doesn't single out any specific community or um, in South Africa. Around this facility, um, around the multipurpose courts, uh, uh, court, I did speak about the kiosks. So the kiosks are where you know people can sell food they, they could, could sell products and these kiosks are um, obviously had to be secure so they can open up and that's what you, we're showing here it's like one is closed and then what it looks like when it's open um, for people to socialize over the weekend when when people are using the basketball court or the skate park um, and all, um, what the facility has to offer so basically this is just a section to show um, what the facility looks like. So here you can see the amount of trees that we planted um, in the facility. The this section cuts through the multi-purpose court. Um, and you can see where the taxi is on the left, how high you are elevated above um, the facility looking in. So it's, there's a connection to the community. And the old field house we opened up um, to create these two studios, a boxing studio and a dance studio um, on the ground floor level and the first floor level. Um, 
and that is also opened up onto the trees. So everybody lives who can see the trees and the facilities um, and the bottom of the activity down below. And also the skylights and everything in, the, in that field house is all, all of it's done in accordance to the pattern making and the, the graphic design language you wanted to, to take through the facility. The image below shows the actual roof and the, the multipurpose court. And it shows the berms and the seating in the middle image with, with, the, with the, um, the shading canopy above. And then the, the, the right hand image shows the, the structure and the involvement, the engineering into, into this roof structure, which was quite extensive. This is just another uh, section through the, um, the main entry from Krasani Drive. So it basically the bottom left hand image shows the main entry as it is actually. So you can see this roof um, floating over this facility. And again, this showing the elevation from Krasani Drive down and the new main entry into the, into the facility um, and the kiosks in the background and obviously the trees. And the, the, the right hand bottom image shows the, the shadows that, that gets um, cast through, this, um, through the canopy roof. So you have a double layer of shadowing on the, on the floor and also um, the, uh, the rebar canopy at the top. The use of rebar, sorry, the use of rebar was, was quite significant for us because it's kind of a material that's never in the limelight. Rebar is always in foundations underground. So we had this uh, connection between, um, we, we wanted to make rebar the, the, the star of the show, like a product, um, and, and it's a material that, that, that's uh, kind of, yeah, um, not recognized. So we wanted to kind of to have this connection between the previously disadvantaged people to have the connection to the star, you know, become a star in the future. So there was this symbolic um, connection between these, between this roof and the material use of that. This section just shows the cross section from, uh, it is east, yeah, uh, east to west uh, through the skate park. Um, yeah, so there we can see the, the use of rammed earth onto uh, in the skate park. And this skate park was built by, by a South African Olympic um, skateboarder called Dallas. Um, he's quite an interesting person to work with. And there's only funny enough two South Africa, two people in South Africa that built skate parks. So it was, it was quite an interesting process. Um, but what's very, very um, heartwarming about this facility and the skate park is the, the people that use it. I mean, it is, it is, it's just so busy during the day from, um, and especially over weekends. So it's really, really very um, fulfilling for people that worked on the project to see that it's, it's in use and kudos to the client because they activated each space. So like, like, you know, you can build anything you want, but if your client and, and the people um, that, that operate the space don't get, get to activate and make sure that this facility can get used, then it, it means nothing. So what the client did is they got specific people um, to, to do you know, skateboard classes, to specific people to do dance classes, specific people to, to help with soccer and five-a-side soccer. So the client is super active in this whole process of, um, of making, making this uh, facility a success. Just quickly, the interior. So this is the existing field house um, uh, that we, we changed the interior. So this was the old main entrance into the facility from the parking area. So we, we moved all the, um, the, the ablution facilities to the lower ground floor, which we, we made into the change rooms. And then number 15 there in the middle is the, is the, the players tunnel where the, uh, the soccer players, all the teams stand next to each other to go into the soccer field. The first floor, um, we, we changed this, the first floor is into the studios uh, where there's a dance floor studio, a maker studio where people asked for technology to, to use computers, 3D printing, all that type of stuff to do, to be creative because they didn't necessarily have these things available. And then the, the, the first floor is just, um, it's another studio. That's just a section through the interior space. So the top right hand corner, you could see the, the language of these triangles going through the entire facility um, and then the, the two studios that you could see. And just lastly, I mean, it's just the, the, all the artists involved um, into, in this facility is um, well-known. Um, Luisa was a, a well-known African um, comic book artist. He did the main, the main artwork and then also future or, or artists might uh, uh, images of, of legends of Soweto and sport, and that became part of the community um, hub 
um, um, area. And then, yeah, um, we are very proud about this facility being used and we are, we're very fortunate about um, being part of it. And it's, it's, a, it's a, a great uh, facility for the community of Soweto. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carl. I'm sure that was a lot to cover in 20 <laughs> minutes. And uh, I really appreciated the detail. I think uh, there are very few moments we get to really sort of sit with the project and, and hear from the designer themselves. Every aspect, you know, not trying to be too stereotypical with some aspects and really allow the identity to come through. And I was just chatting with my team now about that important aspect of, of interface with communities. So many projects are sort of islands and really cut off despite the architectural merit and and the star architects they have really are distant and and that creates even more more issues if there's no real uh, physical ownership and emotional ownership with yeah, i mean um, that, that was project. the most important thing is to make the community the owners owners of this of this facility thank you we're going to travel from soweto to kenya uh, and hear from moses and Deritu, who's an executive with over 25 years experience in leadership and management, managerial roles. He's the Chief Revenue Officer, officer at BASIGO. Moses is responsible for guiding stakeholders on the strategy and business approach on the electrification of the Kenyan PSV sector, as well as advising the business on the navigation of Kenya's transportation regulatory landscape. His philosophy is to introduce fresh perspectives and new techniques, allowing businesses to evolve and grow. Similar to Basigo, his goal is to remain on the cutting edge of advancements, which is why he's with us today. His role as a dad inspires him, motivates him, and drives him to bring valuable contributions to the team by identifying innovative approaches and improved solutions to business challenges. Uh, and if you needed to know, Moses is an adventure biker who I believe has uh, biked from Kenya to South Africa and is also passionate about hiking, uh, both of which he undertakes in uh, what he calls his free time. So thank you so much, Moses, for joining us and, um, and sharing a bit more about the development of the e-mobility sector um, and the need for sustainable mobility options uh, in the coming years and decades. You're welcome to share your screen. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor to be part of this uh, very esteemed panel. Uh, I think we've had two very excellent uh, presentations before me, and I hope that I will also do justice uh, to my presentation. Basically, Basigo is um, what and Basigo, what we're trying to do is electrify um, urban commuting through uh, what we in Kenya we call matatus or buses across Africa. That's actually what we're trying to do, and through a creative um, a creative financing model of pay as you drive, which I'll talk to talk about a bit more in uh, in my in detail in my presentation. I think the one thing that maybe COVID, one of the things that COVID has taught us in Africa is choking, and it's choking through emissions. Um, in my adult life as a child, you could sitting in Nairobi, you could easily see Mount Kenya, and we took it for granted. As an adult, it's only after uh, the lockdown that we actually could see Mount Kenya, which is roughly 200 kilometers north of the city. But at the same time, depending on where you are in Nairobi, you could actually see Mount Kilimanjaro. The only thing that was missing in that period was uh, a lot of public transport. So 40% of all um, Africans in Nairobi and other cities like Nairobi are actually using uh, diesel buses to get from point A to point B. And there are over 1 million diesel buses across Africa. These buses are responsible for more than 25% of all CO2 in, in our environment. Therefore, Africa is choking. But there is a business idea behind where we're choking. There's $17 billion, um, there's a $17 billion market for diesel, which is imported for, for the buses and for maintenance. And that is in the area where we are looking uh, to, to play with as Basigo. Now, why, why is it important for us to electrify buses? And I'll talk about a bit uh, in East Africa. Uh, the cost of electricity, in East Africa, we've got 70% renewable sources of electricity that could be either geothermal, hydro, uh, wind, and now even solar. But in Kenya, we actually have 92% renewable electricity. The cost of electric buses has been falling for the last 10 years. Um, and basically, the cost of electric vehicles has actually dropped over 50% over the last uh, 
10 years. And another phenomenon why electrifying uh, public transport makes a lot of sense in Kenya and in East Africa is we've got excess supply of power. At night especially, we, in, uh, we, we've got over 25% of all the power that is actually generated going to waste. Now that has an effect of uh, inflating your bill because you already have that as, as much as the power is generated, it is not used. So it actually ends up in your bill. And then there's the environmental impact by just, if I take, if I just take one diesel bus per year, every year one diesel bus will give you, a 25 seater diesel bus will give you 60 tons of carbon per year. While an electric bus in comparison only uh, emits that three tons. Uh, on the other side, if you want to look at it from a money point of view, a diesel bus is consuming $2,000 per month in, in, um, in imported diesel, while an electric bus will actually only take $440 worth of electricity that is actually generated locally. If that's not a case for uh, if that's not a case for electrifying public transport, then let us look at uh, that there's zero emissions from electric buses. And that and those emissions, remember, are uh, responsible for one out of five deaths in in the continent. So, how does the PSV sector work in Kenya? Basically, the uh, there are around fifteen thousand uh, diesel buses, and they are run by around two hundred uh, licensed um, transport companies in Kenya. We call them SACOs or Savings and Credit Organizations, which is the was the easiest. Uh, is just a body corporate they would come up with so that the government could regulate them. For a SACO, you must have a minimum of 30 vehicles in your fleet uh, and no maximum. So some big SACOs have actually over 200 and, or 250 buses of, uh, within their fleet. Normally, the average bus owner who puts the bus in the SACO will, uh, will take a loan of three to four years, an asset finance loan, and will will run that bus over that period and at the end of at the end of uh, finishing his loan, he's able to break even and will keep the bus for another three or four, three or four years, maybe uh, up to around year six, year seven, and then he will sell the bus or it will have come to its natural uh, death. So every year we've got around 10% of all uh, buses running in Nairobi being replaced with, with, new, uh, with new, that's around 1,500 diesel Matatu buses coming in. And then um, typically how it operates is a driver will pick up a bus at between 5 and 6 a.m. in the morning and they will drive a certain route. Our routes in uh, Nairobi are mainly uh, hub and spoke, so most of the routes are from the city to, an, uh, to a suburb outside, the, outside the, the city, around 20 or 30 kilometers in range, and that bus will do that route back and forth for, a period, for the whole day and usually covers around 250 kilometers. Thereafter, during the operations, the drivers and conductors will collect the, uh, the fares in cash and uh, or sometimes mobile money, but majority of the money is, is actually collected in cash. Towards the end of the day or towards the early evening at around 10 p.m., that vehicle will, will go back to a petrol station where it will be fueled and using the day's takings and whatever remains on top, the driver will pay himself and the conductor and will remit the difference to the owner and to the transport company of the circle. And then overnight, the, uh, the bus will stay there in the, in the petrol station overnight. So what they do is they get free parking in exchange for guaranteed fuel, fuel uh, fueling every day. Now, for us to electrify uh, passenger transport or electrify Matatu, we might actually have to overcome five problems. The first problem is bus design. None of these electric buses are built for Africa, so we must actually look at that. We must actually look at uh, how to uh, assemble these vehicles locally, because if we don't assemble locally, then we cannot be able to take advantage of, of the taxes, of better taxes when you locally assemble. Number three, we must look at the cost of batteries. The most expensive part of uh, electric, of any electric vehicle from a motorcycle to all the way to a bus or a truck is the battery, so we must actually design something towards dealing with a high upfront cost of the batteries. Then the chicken and the egg in electric uh, mobility is always the charging infrastructure. Should you get the vehicles fast or should you get the charging infrastructure fast? So you must deal with that problem. And last but not least, you must deal with the service and maintenance issue. If you, even if you have a beautiful bus that is, emit, that is uh, not emitting anything, if it cannot be maintained or serviced locally, then you'll have a problem and it will not be accepted in the market. 
So part of our business plan at Basigo is actually solving those five problems, and I'll take you how we are solving them. Um, so under bus design, what we are working with in, in a pilot project that we are running right now with two buses, every single week we have a call with our OEM in China, which is BYD, and what we do is we give them the feedback on what we are seeing, and that way it, it's helping design the next lot of buses, which will be much better designed and will be much better suited for the African roads and the Kenyan roads, which we know we have some gigantic bumps that should actually be called mountains on the road, but we do have them. The second issue is local assembly. Uh, together with uh, Associated Vehicle Assemblers, which is a local uh, assembly plant, and uh, together who, with BYD is to create local assembly, which we intend to have uh, rolled up by quarter two of next year. This will then give us an opportunity to get a lower tax level and that, and that makes the vehicle more affordable. I will jump the higher phone cost and go to lack of charging. As, as part of our pay as you drive, every bus comes with a charger. At the current rate and for the next year or 18 months, we will be operating one bus, one charger. But however, we know that in future we'll be able to move to one to two, and that way the charging network, which I'll talk about later, will be uh, will be um, spread across the city and will mirror the routes these buses go to. And then due the issue of servicing and maintenance, we are actually training and uh, and signing up with uh, technical colleges to be able to train technicians to actually be able to uh, deliver maintenance of these buses. So the biggest problem you're left with is a high upfront cost. But how we have dealt with that is creatively, we have created a pay as you drive financing model, whereby the bus owner will pay exactly the same amount he pays for a diesel bus, but then signs a lease, a separate lease uh, uh, for, for the battery, where the, uh, a battery subscription, which gives him um, both charging and maintenance. And that subscription is equivalent to what he actually pays for diesel, if not less currently. And I'll talk a bit more about that. If I give a little bit about the bus, the current buses that we are operating, we've got two in uh, the BYD K6. This is a bus that is uh, quite successful, over 5,000 5, running in, uh, in the streets of China, a few in Africa, two here, a few in, uh, in Mauritius, and it's a seven meter bus with 25 seats. We've got a range of 250 kilometers for our recharge uh, from zero to full. And um, it's, 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 a, it's a premium coach with good leather seats, Wi-Fi in the bus, USB charging, and multimedia. As I said, bus we we get the bus from BYD, which is one of the which is the world's largest electric bus manufacturer. And by next year, we shall be assembling those buses here in partnership with Association of Vehicle Manufacturers, who currently assemble Fuso, Mahindra, Scania, and many other brands currently. So, what's the what are we actually giving to? to the passenger and to the bus owners. Not only are we just giving them a bus, we actually want to capitalize, to capitalize on, the, uh, on the popularity of the bus and the fact that we're giving them a higher quality, a higher quality uh, vehicle. So uh, at the moment, we've got a bus tracking because we have found that some uh, of the passengers who want to board the buses are actually uh, waiting specifically for the bus. So you can, Today, you can go on an app, which we're working on, and which will be able to reserve your seat uh, in the bus, and you'll actually even be able to pre-book, uh, which then means that gives uh, a bit more certainty and reduces the amount of time that anyone who's been to Nairobi will see buses queuing for long periods, especially off-peak. But if, if a passenger can book because they want to be in that electric bus and know that specific time, then that gives them a, a very a, a, a much better experience. And then... Uh, and better return on and better return to the owner. Over and above that, for the bus owner, we've launched Smart Bus. This is already running with the, the two pilot buses. And Smart Bus gives them a full visibility of their bus. They can check where their bus is, how many passengers are in the bus, how much they've collected at any one point. They can check how many kilowatts the bus is using, even how or how many uh, kilowatts per per kilometer, then how the driver is, is driving. So that gives full visibility. Uh, which they did not have previously, and that also then helps them control their business and actually maximizes their return on investment. Um, in regards to charging, um, what we are trying to do is once we once a bus taco or a batatu taco or a trans or a transporter um, signs up with us, the first thing we do is deploy our researchers to understand their route and map out their route so that we can actually be able to 
not change their model of operation. So just they, they can operate exactly in the same way they've been operating, where the bus starts at 5 a.m. and can go all the way to 10 p.m. in the night. But then between 11 p.m. and 5 a.m., we can then have overnight parking at a place that is convenient within the route. Uh, at that point when the bus is parked, it can also undergo charging. Uh, so it could be charged uh, with our uh, 30 kilowatt charger. Uh, it undergoes a routine uh, inspection and maintenance that way we reduce downtime. So if there's any maintenance to be done, it's done overnight. And we also clean and decontaminate the buses daily during that downtime. So we are not only just giving them a good bus, but we're also giving them an excellent service, which is also covered through the uh, pay as you drive. So if I maybe talk about the pay as you drive, I maybe alluded to it a little. Today, the, currently what an, uh, a bus owner does, he will go to a local bank uh, and borrow or get a higher purchase or debt finance for the bus. And that is exactly what we're doing. We're asking them to go to the same local banks and we're signing up with those local banks to be able to, for them to use uh, to finance um, the electric buses. On securing that debt finance to buy the electric bus, he signs a battery subscription, uh, which includes charging and maintenance with Basigo. And Basigo is able to look for debt funding from DFIs or Clean Energy Finance to be able to underwrite that battery. And so there, therefore the owner has peace of mind for the period of, of eight years of, um, of the warranty of that bus that he has no worry about um, charging maintenance or, um, or how the bus operates. So he, the, the the idea is for the owner to to rake in as many miles as possible and hence carry as many passengers as possible and hence increase as much uh, his return as much as possible but by just and having just one place to go for maintenance charging and and um, and all and his battery subscription in case of anything happens to the battery then we cover the warranty which we pass on the warranty from the manufacturer to the owner so the owner then has no fear of has no range anxiety or has no fear about um, um, that being new technology that it may not last very long. Um, I'll run through quickly on this one, the monthly income, uh, as, and we have proved this through our pilot on our electric bus, which is a 25 seater, is roughly $4,800 against a 33 seater diesel, which is $4,300. Uh, we are keeping the bank loan exactly the same. The subscription, which uh, which is more or less equivalent to diesel, you can see slightly lower to $2,050 as opposed to what they would spend with diesel at $2,100. Wages and expenses are exactly the same. So their net, net cash at the end of the month with an electric bus is $750 against $140 with, um, with a 33-seater bus. So if you look at that over the years, especially after finishing the, the, the initial loan, then um, somebody operating, an operator using an electric bus is getting uh, much higher, at least 20% higher revenue per seat on, uh, than a diesel bus on the same route. So, and maybe our model, I'll just talk about what, how, where, because we are a business, what, where do we make our money or how are we making our money? Currently, with our two pilot buses, as you can see there, we're actually on a negative six uh, return on investment. And this is because we are not locally assembled, the design is not optimized, there is no mid-volume production, no carbon subsidies or EV, or EV incentives from the government. But by just doing one very small thing and just by scaling up and moving to at least 50 vehicles locally assembled, we immediately break even. And you can see that scenario that we actually go into 1% return on investment by just changing one simple thing, uh, which is um, local assembly because the import and VAT taxes are very high. But if we then scale towards 200 vehicles or, and more, and you have, uh, and you, and you have, uh, now you, you get all the economies of scale of local assembly, of buying power from there, and that you then can monetize the carbon subsidies. But the one thing we have not put in our model is the EV tax incentives, because we, we don't know where the government will be going with that, but we are hoping that if that comes, it would actually increase our return on investment from uh, the 20 to almost 30 percent if that then case. But that tells you our business model can work even without the government incentives. Current two buses, they have been run by two different operators. One is City Hopper running uh, easterly route from the CBD of Nairobi all the way to the airport. And the other one is by a company called East Shuttle running from the city stadium on the east part of the town 
and then all the way to the Dandora Stadium. And so far, over 60 days of pilot, we actually hit 60 days uh, on Friday, last Friday. We have done over 26,000 kilometers and carried uh, 30,000 passengers, mitigated 16 tons of, um, of CO2 and avoided 7,672 liters of diesel. And on that, again, we are getting a 20% higher revenue per seat on these buses. Remember, the reason why we do that is most buses in Nairobi are 33 seats. Our bus is slightly smaller, like 25 seats. But when you check revenue per seat, it's actually higher. The pilot has been extremely successful. Uh, a lot of the people who run the bus love it because it's, it's big, it's airy, it's very quiet. Uh, you've got Wi Fi. Uh, free Wi-Fi in the buses. You can uh, USB ports for everybody so that they can charge their phones as they're enjoying their trip. So the, it, it, from that success, we have found that we've got reservations. We're expecting to be at um, to have roughly 20 reservations by the end of the year. We are sitting at high 70s and we expect to close at above 100 by the end of this year. Uh, by the end of the year, we shall have 17 buses running. And for next year, we expect to have at least 200 buses running in Nairobi. The path to scale is when by bus size, currently we are operating in the 25, 33 to 40 seater bus. There might be the opportunity for the Nairobi bus rapid transport if it's available. We are getting a lot of interest from private schools and there's a possibility of the majority of, uh, of uh, public service vehicles or matatus in Nairobi are 14 seaters. Uh, another path to scale is now then by vehicle type where we can move towards uh, trucks, so urban courier trucks, water delivery and heavy duty trucks, which is also, which are beginning to be electrified. And the last but not least, and in the path to scale is starting in Kenya, proving it that it can work within the next one or two years, which we're already doing, and then moving to the greater East Africa and then sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so in, in a nutshell, that's what, uh, that's what we are doing at Basigo. We intend to be the company that replaces dirty diesel in our transportation and give, um, we give, um, uh, Africa, a new electrified and clean transport uh, system. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Moses. And thank you for giving us so much detail about what it takes. Uh, you know, you, you spoke about the design of the buses. They've got to be equipped for our roads. You know, you, uh, you can't have this sort of uh, uh, fragile, perfect bus, which, which can't deal with any sort of... Uh, sharp turns or, or difficult road conditions and all the way through assembly to scaling up to the taxes involved in scaling up and importing parts. So thank you for that detail. I think it, it's not just important from a bus go perspective, but I think if you read all the research and I'm sure you do, um, e-mobility and that, that electric transition in, in all forms of mass transit, public transit, e-bikes uh, really is, um, Sorry, my watch was speaking to me. It really is the future of, uh, of, uh, of African cities and will be key to the, the urban futures of, of large and intermediary, uh, intermediate sized cities in, in uh, Africa. Um, so from buses, we move to um, Nifemi Marcus Bello, who is an industrial designer and founder of an Embello studio in Nigeria. Uh, he's a designer known for his community led an ethnographic conscious design approach. And from what I read as well, uh, inspired by certain road trips to different places. Um, Nefemi's strength lies in the exploitation of materials and his fearlessness to pursue new forms and typologies to create truly unique products and experiences. Thank you so much, um, Nefemi, for joining us. I know that you're traveling uh, and you're in demand all over the world. <laughs> Um, so thank you so much and for sharing your, your perspectives on, on how you're using creativity and design uh, in your work. Uh, you're welcome to start sharing your screen when you're ready. Uh, thank you so much for having me. This is really a privilege and um, honor. Um, I've really been inspired by most of the presentations I've seen today. And I'm excited to talk you through some of the stuff that I'm currently working on. Um, and also um, a project called the Wolf Kiosk. Okay, um, so the title of this presentation is um, Africa Designers Utopia. Um, and this is a significant title because it kind of plays into 
a research project that I've kicked off last month that's looking into anonymously designed um, objects across West African cities. Um, for me, I think it's really important to figure out what contemporary African design is and how current urbanization is kind of influencing various type of products and typologies across the cities um, that we live in and how these products have sort of integrated into our daily lives and how we as um, community dwellers and ac across Africa should kind of consider this product as great design tools and how we can sort of elevate them or embrace them into our daily lives. One of the products that I'm currently looking at um, and carrying out research on is called the Quali. It's very um, present in day-to-day -day life in Lagos. It's a portable kiosk that um, you can see in most traffic jams in Lagos where it's used to sell confectionaries across the city where people spend close to <laughs> um, a, an hour or two to, commun to commute from work to their houses. So a lot of people have to kind of interact with these products to get day-to-day -day products um, through these hawkers. Um, the idea for the research is to kind of break down the bill of materials of these products and create some sort of archive through 3D scanning um, and showcase these products as truly innovative and groundbreaking design in my own opinion that's been anonymously designed by communities across um, my city Lagos um, so I'm going to be looking at various products as well um, but today I'll just be talking through a project um, what the WAF kiosk but I will also talk through some of the products that I've designed um, in a couple of years so to sort of tie into um, the idea behind the wharf kiosk as well. Um, so as <laughs> Rajik mentioned, I'm an industrial designer. Um, and one of the, <laughs> one of the issues that I had with the client approaching me for this wharf kiosk was I'm an industrial designer and I don't actually design installations and I'm not really an architect, so to speak. Um, but the client made it very clear that they wanted the kiosk itself to be a product and act as a product and making sure that the, um, the kiosk could actually live amongst the, the community that they sort of interact with, but also engaging the community to create the product and also making the product in it itself as open source as possible so that we can eventually develop um, the products after the first phase and, um, um, and second phase of the project. Um, so I will talk through some of these products you can see on my screen um, to, sh to kind of give you an idea of what the design process that we take in the studio is. The first product on the left but the, is the LM store. Um, it's a store that's actually made in Lagos, Nigeria, but has found its way across the world um, through a very heavy demand. And we've kind of, we've sold, I think, approximately 350 stools um, in about a year and a half. The idea for this stool actually birthed the uh, thought process on how, on why I created the studio. Um, and one of the reasons um, this, one of the ways the store came about was me trying to figure out what production techniques and manufacturing techniques were available across Lagos. Um, through this research, I stumbled onto um, an, an indigenous generator manufacturer um, who make backup generators for both private and industrial um, facilities. And walking into the factory, after having various conversations with them, they were very skeptical to collaborate with the designer. 
But one thing that I assured them was that I was going to design around their production techniques and manufacturing techniques and not dictate the assembly line. Um, so after a few visits and back and forth with the engineers, um, the LM store was born. And the idea was to kind of create um, an economically viable product that could kind of uh, push the envelope of what contemporary African design look like. Because one of the things that I spoke to the engineers about and the factory was that African design, even though I don't know why it still needs to have a tag, but African design in general is very contextual. It's contextual to humans, it's contextual to the materials around them, and it's also contextual to the experience. So creating some of these, um, having some of these dialogues and approaches actually allowed us to play around with a lot of the forms um, and ideologies and approach to create other products, um, such as the cellar lamp that you see, you see in the middle um, there. Um, I think our latest project that we're kind of diving into um, at the studio quite a bit now is a hand washing station called For the Community by the Community. Um, the idea for this hand washing station came about, of course, with COVID happening. And I was actually living in Rwanda, um, consulting on various projects for um, Mass Design Group. And unfortunately, um, the contract had to be cut short and I had to move back to Lagos. Um, when I moved back to Lagos, I was bombarded with a lot of phone calls from the artisans that I tend to collaborate with. And some of these artisans I've worked with since I was 13 um, as an apprentice, um, welder and woodmaker. And one of the things that we were having discussion about was there was um, a lack of work and engagement with them during COVID and they wanted to figure out how to create a product or, or have something to do during their downtime. Um, and of course, there was um, a lack of hand washing stations across Lagos. And the idea was to collaborate with these artisans to create um, an affordable, compact, modular and um, adaptable kiosk that was being locally made um, across the artisanal villages in Lagos. Um, so I just, I'm just talking through these projects to kind of give you an idea or thought process of what, how um, we sort of approach projects in the studio. And now I'll talk you through um, the wharf kiosk in itself. So the clients is actually um, a skateboarding brand that's based in Lagos and now, but they were, it was birthed in the UK by a Nigerian called Jomi. Um, wharf in itself has now grown into more than a skateboarding brand, but a community of creatives and um, makers who sort of engage with the brand to create various products and items. Um, the project, so Waffles and Cream kind of approached me because they were changing their identity, um, the thought process and thinking through what uh, it meant to be an African retailer um, especially um, selling skateboarding garments and decks as well. And one of the things that they mentioned was that after they opened their store, they had a lot more engagements outside the store um, and wanted to figure out how to sort of bring the community in and interact with the community through a product. Um, after various conversations, we realized that, of course, maybe pop-up retail would make a lot more sense to engage with the community. And that was the birth of the Wolf kiosk. Um, as I mentioned, an amazing brand uh, coming out of Lagos um, and they're doing fantastic work graphically and sort of creating a skateboarding community that um, I think Lagos in itself is very proud of. So, 
the inspiration for the kiosks came about um, after a visit from to sorry to uh, Benin Republic um, to Port Novo, and from the drive back from Port Novo to Kutonu, I kind of noticed these blinds um, in front of wooden kiosks. Um, and I also noticed that a lot of every single junction that we got in, um, we got to, there were a lot of artisans making these um, blinds out of bamboo. Um, I found it really interesting. The reason was because there was some, so there was community engagement through the artisans in one job from one junction so the people actually selling confectionaries in the kiosk um, who were buying these um, blinds from the artisans. Um, I liked the simplicity of it all. I thought it would be interesting. And this was about three years ago to have in the studio and just lying around. So I bought a couple and then brought it to Lagos with me. Um, and with waffles and cream, um, one of the things that the founder tends to talk about a lot and um, a few of the community dwellers that they work with is how, um, how impressed they are about the bootleg, <laughs> the bootleg uh, streetwear community across uh, Lagos. And one of the setups that's really impressive, um, in my own opinion, architecturally and architect, um, from an architectural standpoint, was the Okrika, is the Okrika setup, where um, young people tend to set up shop on the streets, selling bootleg streetwear, um, and using these stilts made out of wood, mostly reclaimed or recycled wood um, to build extremely high um, platforms where they hang and sort of layer clothes on. And these setups, um, especially in areas such as Leki and Oniru and um, Yaba, I believe, have sort of created um, visual archetypes and visual identities for some of the spaces that we kind of occupy in Lagos and where and how we sort of buy our clothes as well. Um, one thing that we do believe in and we talk about across um, the studio is that as much as possible, we try to make products 50 kilometers um, away from the studio. And if it's that, it's a sort of a site specific project with um, creating actual bespoke products, um, figuring out how to also keep that um, distance with where the site would be. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, the Waffles and Cream store, which is um, a new space that was um, open in Lekki last year, um, kind of had uh, um, a few renovations here and there to help improve with their design identity. And one of the things that we did was kind of understand what the color palettes are, were and their thought process of what type of materials they wanted to kind of interact with and engage with. Um, eventually, after speaking with them, there were, we noticed that they were, trying, they were gravitating towards a lot of natural materials um, and very clean and clear color palettes. One of the things that I also mentioned um, to them was with the community engagement that whatever we created, it would be interesting to kind of make sure that whoever the contractors were, if, that, if it was artisans or any sort of contractors, that they would be help, they would be able to keep help with the upkeep of whatever we design, um, and also with the product development and making sure that whatever we design was more of a kit of parts, um, so that development could always happen in the process. And sorry, one thing I forgot to mention was that the timeline was extremely short. Um, so, <laughs> hence the idea and thought process of creating um, a final product or project that would become like a kit of parts that we could always develop um, 
on the norm. Um, so the final product was basically um, a kiosk that was hexagonal in shape and was both modular in experience and form. And the idea for this was that, um, again, how can we sort of create a kiosk um, that's easily um, transportable, easily um, produced, um, and also easily um, experienced? Because with a lot of the um, retail spaces that they were kind of engaged with, they were realizing very quickly that, um, hello, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly, thank you. Hello? We can hear you. We can hear you. Okay, sorry, I'm back. I think I lost you for a second. No problem. Yeah. Um, so the I. Okay. Um, so the idea for the kiosk was um, to create something that was modular in both experience and form, and to create something that was extremely lightweight and easily transportable. Um, with the material that we chose, again, being inspired by these bamboo um, uh, blinds that were found in Benin Republic, um, the idea was to kind of adapt this way of weaving and have dialogue and conversation with the weavers in Lagos. This kind of proved a bit difficult, of course, um, communicating with weavers um, in Benin Republic. But we were able to find um, a bunch of weavers who were just migrated from Accra um, with similar techniques and actually through Zoom um, and various um, partners in Benin Republic, we were able to um, bring these weavers together and an exchange and dialogue um, was actually being had as the product was being developed. So in itself, the idea for the project um, was realized very quickly. Um, but like, as I mentioned, the, the modularity and um, in both experience and form means that we're actually going to be able to add various kits of parts, which we're currently developing in the studio. Um, and um through engagements through like experiences through their customers we're identifying what exactly that the customer actually wants to experience in the spaces and kind of creating briefs around them to create new products that we can put into the spaces um so this is the assembly of the kiosk in itself um the master assembly um as and as i mentioned as well um it's extremely lightweight um it actually fits into um pickup trucks or a van or vans that's readily available in lagos so it can be moved from one side to the other very easily um this is a waffles and cream staff on the left and the security guard on the right just moving it from um the wharf store to um to um a community of um, um, on the right. So thank you. Uh, my apologies that it was extremely quick. I have to catch a, a flight very in about an hour. Um, so I try to keep it as short as possible. Thank you, Nefemi, and thank you for taking us through your philosophy and you know what works, what doesn't work, and uh, and uh, and how you ended up despite some setbacks with this particular kiosk. And uh, just from my perspective, the, the images are beautiful and they're, they're really all over the internet, <laughs> especially the part 
where two people can actually carry the structure. I think of, of parts of Cape Town where every single day people are dismantling market structures and, and there's an entire economy around moving those market structures and all their goods into storage units. So um, a lightweight structure already makes the, the world uh, of difference. Uh, we have about 20 minutes for questions. We've been noting all of them. Uh, for those who have not seen, um, um, some of our speakers, Moses and Carl, have responded directly in the chat. So I think, Antonio, we'll start with yourself. Uh, it's always nice to get a response in person. Here's a question around the uh, Tetra Pak walls, the upcycled Tetra Pak walls from Andrew Walton, um, who mentions, did you make this or purchase from the suppliers, Antonia? So they're made by Romani Recyclers, a company called Romani Recyclers. And what's really cool about it is the manufacturer, the owner, also produces pick and peel juice in, and he sells them in Tetra Packs. So um, they're manufactured in Pika. Okay, great. Romani Upcyclers. There is also a question from uh, Blake Robinson, um, who says, firstly, thank you, very interesting presentation. Um, he's interested in the collective food purchasing, which is a very interesting idea. And the question is, I wonder if this has been tried at scale of an apartment building before, the collective food purchasing. I don't think it has been done in an apartment block before, but there are women groups and SACOs and people who, you know, who tend to buy things in groups. That's been happening in Africa since. But yeah, not as a, a building apartment block, I don't think. Great. And just a reminder that everyone... You can still um, paste your questions or raise your hand if you wish to ask a question. I have noted that, um, thank you, Carl and, uh, and Moses for replying to some of the, the other questions. Um, I have a question for Nefemi, um, if you are still here <laughs> with us for a few more minutes. Uh, yes, I am. One more minute. Uh, I think, are there, were there any, um, I think everyone always tries to think that there's some sort of perfect market structure that fits into the perfect context that, um, and then, you know, you could just replicate it. But um, what would you say you struggled with in terms of this particular kiosk? What was, what was really something you had to think about in terms of um, the purpose of the kiosk? Um, what is the biggest challenge, I suppose? I think the biggest challenge, one thing that the, the client kept mentioning was, figuring out what the, what retail experiences felt like across Africa. Um, and what does that, what does it mean for um, a contemporary African to sort of consume or buy a product? Um, and one of the things that we were struggling with was the fact that local materials are kind of seen as cheap. Um, and would that affect the brand in itself? Um, and I think one of the things that the brand is trying to do with that is they're actually figuring out ways to educate and carry along their, um, uh, their customer base, the design process with them. So they're asking the studio to walk, to have some sessions or workshops actually talking about local materials um, with, with the various skateboarders and other skateboarding brands as well to educate them on how superior our materials can be as well if we use them in the right way. Thank you, Nefemi. Carl, I know that there are many elements to the, the Sharper Soweto Center. Were there any surprising aspects? I know as, as, as designers, that as much of the program and as much of the use one tries to, to plan and accommodate, but what was the most surprising aspect for yourself and your team? When the, perhaps space. That's an interesting question, but it was the shadows because um, you don't plan for those. I mean, when <laughs> when you put that canopy on there and you saw the shadows on the on the ground, it was absolutely mind blowing. It was really uh, we did we did a couple of 3D models and looked at the shadows, but the, yeah, it was just so surprising when you saw that. So, I mean, that in Afrikaans they call it the pox. I mean, what I don't know what the pox is in in English. It's a uh, I don't know. Something you didn't plan for, or it's just, yeah, it's, it was an amazing thing. So the shadows, yes, that was it. And obviously the skateboarding, I mean, the enthusiasm and the need for, for skate park and sweater was also super surprising for everybody involved. And yeah, 
I think those two things are. Uh, Carl, do you think that people have different perspectives now than 10 years ago about the sports that youth demand and, and the kinds of interests they have? Um, did, you, did you find in your engagement? Yeah, absolutely. Because I think it's so valuable to speak to people when you're in a community and you're doing projects for, pe for in a community, especially like a sports facility. It's super important to speak to the community and their needs because you have this, you just think Soweto soccer, you know, and it's, it's not that at all. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> there's a lot, a lot of different stuff going on, dance, a lot of creative people, a lot of artists. I mean, it's, like, it's so diverse and I, I don't think people really um, know that about Soweto um, at all. So, yeah. I think that's true across various neighborhoods of South Africa. There are neighborhoods within neighborhoods, and and often we cling to one narrative because it's yeah. it's easy to just to define an area in a singular way. No, definitely. Uh, Moses, moving. Thank you, Carl. Moses, moving to you. There's a question about the uh, whether you could retrofit existing buses to run to run an electricity, which I'm sure you've thought about, uh, instead of replacing them entirely, or is that just too difficult or expensive from a procurement perspective or a cost perspective or, or too much too much effort? And then my question for myself is just um, uh, in terms of scaling up, is there a particular point where the revenue starts to make sense in a city or a town? So I suppose two questions. Could you retrofit with electricity and, and what's that tipping point of revenue? Uh, there is, um, there is um, uh, in Nairobi a company that is actually doing retrofitting of existing buses. However, we do have um, a particular challenge uh, in uh, once you retrofit. Uh, is that vehicle still, uh, if it's you retrofit a Toyota vehicle into an electric vehicle, is it still a Toyota? And so it, you then get foul of the law and regulations of, uh, so you might not be able to use it in certain places and especially for passenger uh, transport where it's quite sensitive. So yes, you could retrofit, but that's not our model. Our model is uh, we have well, the first OEM we're working with is BYD. Uh, so we would like to work, but of course, we are also open to working with other uh, EV uh, OEMs to bring uh, to bring the technology here. And coming to the point, the second point, where does it by when do we start when do we start breaking even? Just by one very simple thing, as I said in my presentation. By just for RAC, by just uh, doing local assembly where we save a lot of the taxes because uh, the way taxes are cal calculated on vehicles are that you get all the levies and then they're compounded. So it's let's say you have a railway levy and then a shipping levy, then then you put the uh, excise, you know, put the uh, import duty, then excise, and then VAT on all that. So by reducing that, immediately we then start breaking uh, breaking even. But for the operator, as we are running the the pilot. Um, just by, I mean, comparing um, apples with apples, you take a 25-seater diesel uh, bus and a 25-seater electric electric bus. Uh, with an electric bus, you're already making 20% higher re revenues uh, by just reducing your costs. And then we're also noticing that it's actually much more popular than the than the, than the diesel than the diesel bus. So there's also an opportunity there. Thanks, Moses. Antonio, uh, tell us a bit more about uh, your timelines. Um, how do you, how do you, well, if you can, um, how do you uh, speak to your target market and launch and, and factor in construction times? Uh, do you have a particular target in the next few years, if not sooner? So um, we have two sites and just on the outskirts of Nairobi, one is in Matone, one is in Pika. We want to have a showroom up by August, end of July, August, and then we'll start selling. I mean, we're already collecting expressions of interest that will be confirmed at show house. And then the construction time is 18 months. Um, yeah. And so both sites will be, will hopefully start construction. Yeah, at the roughly, at the roughly around the same time. So another interesting thing that we're kind of looking at is traditional sales, which is mortgages. Um, but <clears throat> we are also considering that young people in the future don't really necessarily want to own a house. They're quite comfortable moving around in Airbnbs and living in different places. So we're also looking at a group investment scheme sort of thing where people, it's, it's more of an investment where you sort of pay a certain amount and then get some dividends every month. So that's something interesting that we're looking at, which is also a group community kind of way of looking at things. So that will be quite interesting. 
Antonio, there were also questions in the <clears> chat about the, the affordability in the target market. In South yeah. Africa in particular, there's a lot of debate around whether affordability means uh, whether a, a unit or a home is affordable in relation to the area it's in or in terms of the groups that are not allowed currently to buy based on the loans the banks provide or, um, yeah. or various other definitions, you know, percentage income, median income like the U.S., um, yeah. How do you how do you uh, how do you define affordability, but still ensure it's a project that that can get to site? So we 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 were looking at affordability first, just in terms of building, you know, building low cost. Um, so we've managed to keep it um, very low cost, and then it is young people that we're talking about. So mortgages would be about thirty to fifty thousand Kenya shillings. People may be earning around a hundred thousand shillings. Um, <clears throat> I think. For, for us, the biggest challenge has been there's an idea that affordability, affordable housing is not premium looking. Yeah. Um, you know, um, we also have to kind of manage buyers coming in, buying them because they're affordable and then selling them at a really high price. And then, you know, they would make them not affordable anymore. Um, so, yeah, I think affordability to me is, is, is that, you know, young people can afford good housing um yeah so you know we're quite affordable with our with our prices at the moment um quite competitive in the market we would be on the affordable side um and i think i'm quite proud that we've managed to achieve that and still have it looking really good uh just coming back to you to you carl um has this particular project informed some of your other work in the public realm or in the urban realm are there sort of learnings which you can almost directly move into into other areas? Um, uh, or do you think this is a very very unique project? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 one thing I wanted to talk about, and one, that's something you have to take out of this, is that the security aspect of of this facility is that we were we dropped the walls down to like one point two meters, and, and and obviously in South Africa everybody's eyes went like this. And luckily, the, yeah, yeah, so luckily the Nike security guys bought into it. So basically there is still security cameras, you know, line of sight security cameras. But I mean, we just found it in the previous facility as well. Like there wasn't any, any damage to the, to, the, to the walls or spray cans on the wall. So if you do a project that, that looks after the community and is, uh, is something that they're proud of, they look after it. So, I mean, the, the, I was very excited about the fact that Nike wanted to show that you can drop the walls um, and, and, and get the people inside to see what's happening in, inside the facility rather than build this three meter high wall. There's, there's been, the facility has been up for, open for six months and there was one incident with a skateboard or whatever that some guy jumped over the wall, but that was it. So I'm pretty sure and confident that, that, the, that the, the community is going to look after that facility and make sure that it, it stays intact. Yeah. So that was the one thing I think we need to trust the communities. We need to trust that if you do good work, people are going to look after it. I mean, um, I think we need to believe in that. Moses, I know that um, the way people move around cities and the way we start to move people are, is critical. You mentioned that, that diesel is choking African cities, especially with 40% of, of passenger trips being, um, being with buses. Um, what else must work in a city to 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 improve the ability for your company and others to provide uh, quality transport that's that's more sustainable i think we we often assume that that one mode of transport be it brt or electric buses or minibus taxis or everything in between needs to work really well but what could city governments do to improve the viability of of transit what else is missing in a, in the puzzle for for your business <laughs> I mean, if I speak about the Kenyan uh, situation, is the way the routes and uh, uh, are, are, are designed it makes it very difficult for you to actually uh, create a, a network of uh, or the infrastructure for electrifying the public transport, because a lot of that is uh, or, or it, the whole entire network is in private hands. So that's actually a big challenge, and of course, uh, just getting access to reliable power. Uh, because if for any reason you don't have reliable power, then that means you've got buses uh, not moving if they're electric. So that's actually has been a quite quite a big challenge. Um, yeah, and uh, 
just a, a bit of sometimes you get and it was alluded to in the questions you get into rivalry between uh, between operators who are operating the same route and in our model we would hope that we could actually share share facilities for uh, for charging so that that is actually a bit of a challenge uh, yeah and 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 even just connecting i mean connecting the first two buses was not as easy because of the amount of power we are looking we've got a 30 kilowatt charger and uh, a lot of those connections even industrial connections are not uh, geared to carrying 30 kilowatts so there's there's a bit of a mind uh, a mind change that needs to happen i think we are in a Sometimes when people think of electric mobility, they just assume you just plug it into your 13 amp socket in your house and you can charge your vehicle. No, but it's a bit more complex than that. Yeah. And for it to work, it must be shared. You can't have um, uh, a one-on-one -on -one situation. All if you if for electric mobility to work, you must share the infrastructure in charging. Thank you so much to all the incredible human beings and designers and and uh, uh, urbanists who've joined our session today. It, it feels a bit like we've had an Our Future Cities think tank on cities in the span of two hours. So uh, Carl, Antonia, Nefemi and Moses, perhaps is, there's a way that the, the four of you and your teams um, really you know, uh, connect with us again uh, and, and tackle not just uh, your particular projects, but some of the other aspects affecting housing, mobility uh, and public space and, and trading in the African and South African context. Um, so thank you for all those who've joined us. Please complete the two-minute survey if you're able to in the next few days. Uh, just uh, a quick note that tomorrow's session uh, is also jam-packed and also really, really exciting. There'll be more of an interview style, so really open conversations with Raima Karoma, the Director of Research and Training at the Sierra Leone Urban Research Unit, discussing the possibilities for cities to run more of their own services, be it power or schools or trains in the South African context. So what does that governance shift look like? We speak to Rudy Krill, who's written a thesis on the devolution of transport and rail, the possibilities for that in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, Sindile um, Mafundla, who's cycled, I think, 150 kilometers in, in Durban, in South Africa. The director of uh, Kailicha Cycles, who will share the role of mobility startups in South Africa, and whether it's possible to cycle an area and inform better and walking cycling infrastructure. Uh, we're also incredibly grateful to have Doreen Adengo, Principal Architect of Adengo Architecture in Uganda, who will showcase the African Mobilities Project and also speak about how movements, um, various forms of movements impact uh, public spaces. And then we are fortunate to have Livingston Mukasa, who uh, presented a keynote lecture today, which you can find online at the RISE website, uh, the Principal of Mahali, I will speak a bit about um, their recent publications on architecture in sub-Saharan Africa and who will act as a provocateur during the interview style session tomorrow. Thank you very much everyone for joining. Um, remember the daily uh, debrief is at 6 p.m. this evening, which is in an hour's time. You'll have a chance to engage freely with uh, the four keynote lecturers today. So bring your dinner and bring your drinks um, and then join us again tomorrow at uh, 3 p.m. But of course, remember the Rise Africa program starts at 10 a.m. Uh, Central African time tomorrow. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. Please uh, connect with our panelists on social media. We've posted all their links and websites um, and find a way to connect with them and support their work, uh, especially those that are about to start and expand and, and scale up. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, you can simply uh, email hello at ourfuturecities.co. I promise we do reply, even if it takes um, a week. Uh, any questions from this session or any you'd like to direct to, to the speakers, you can email us and we'll make sure it gets to them.